Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, where food bloggers come to get their fill of the latest tips, tricks, and insight into the world of food blogging. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll provide you with the tools you need to add value to your blog, and we'll also ensure you're taking care of yourself because food blogging is a demanding job. Now, please welcome your host, Megan Porta. Hey, food bloggers. Are you constantly feeling like you never have enough time, like you can't possibly fit it all in, and you'll never get to those projects you've been wanting to do because of a lack of time? Let me help you find that time because guess what? There is always enough of it. We just need to be intentional about protecting it. Join my Always Enough Facebook group where we will find you the time you are looking for by creating systems in your life and establishing goals and habits. The number of spots available in the first month of this group are limited because I am making the first month free. So stop over to eatblogtalk.com forward slash always enough for more information. Go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash always enough to find that time you are looking for. I'm super excited about this and I will see you there. Okay, food bloggers, have you heard of Flowdesk, the new big email marketing rage? This is an amazing new option for managing your email subscriber list. It is super easy to use and it comes with gorgeous, intuitive drag and drop templates. And Flowdesk does not charge based on number of subscribers. So your monthly rate will stay the same from month to month. Everyone pays $38 a month or use my affiliate link to get 50% off and pay only $19 a month. You guys, this is a fraction of the price of other email service providers, and you'll be blown away by the beautiful and intuitive templates waiting for you inside. Visit eatblogtalk.com forward slash resources to grab your link. Flowdesk, the stunning new option for email marketing. Hello, food bloggers. Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, the podcast made for you, food bloggers seeking value for your businesses and your lives. Today, I will be chatting with Anushree Shetty from SimmerToSlimmer.com, and we will talk about common food blogging mistakes. Anushree is the curator behind the website SimmerToSlimmer.com, a site focused on Asian Indian cuisine. A self-proclaimed foodie, she combines her passion for food and photography to create easy, delicious, and visually appealing recipes to inspire busy moms to cook more often at home. Oh, I can't wait to dig into this with you, Anna Shree. But first, would you mind giving us a fun fact about yourself? Sure, Megan. Thanks for having me here. And the fun fact about me is I moved to the U.S. to do my master's uh, in 2001. And even though I have lived only in four states, I've moved like 14 times. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot. I I don't think I'm going to move for the next five years. Now I'm done. Oh, seriously. I had a period when I was in my early 20s, like right after college, where I did the same. I moved all the time to the point where I was like a family topic. People would be like, oh, where's Megan living now? And so when I found a house, I was like, I am not moving forever because moving is not fun. So I don't envy you. Yeah. And I did my most of my moving as a grad student, too. So I totally relate. Yes. Well, you're in one spot now and hopefully you can stay there for a little while. Where are you, by the way? I live in Chicago. You live in Chicago. I just talked to someone else from Chicago and I'm in Minneapolis. So we're very close. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm excited to talk about common food blogging mistakes and what you have in mind for that and how to avoid that. So before we start, I want to tell you that I went onto your blog and I was browsing through and it is so beautiful. Your photos make me hungry and that doesn't always happen. You know, you can look at food blogs and you're like, oh, that looks pretty good, but you don't get that desire to just go eat. But when I was looking through yours, I was like, ah, I have to go eat. I'm starving. (laughs) So just, yeah, I just wanted to point that out and everybody, you should go look at simmertoslimmer.com as well, just to see how beautiful everything is over there. So, oh, and I was going to point out, you're also an Instant Pot lover or Instant Pot user. Yes, yes, I am. I totally love my Instant Pot. And like most people, I was scared of it. I didn't use it for six months. And now I use it like every single day. Same. I was so afraid of it forever. And I don't know what I was so worried about. But 
Thankfully, we both pulled it out and started using it, right? Yes. So now on to common food blogging mistakes. To start the discussion, would you mind sharing with us about your journey with food blogging, how you got started, and just how learning and growing from mistakes has shaped you as a food blogger? So I started my food blog in 2010, and it was a time when I had taken sabbatical from my work. I'm a computer engineer by background, so I used my computer engineering to the most. I spent about four months perfecting my logo, customizing my theme, and maybe I must have posted a few recipes. So that was my first blogging, food blogging mistake right there. So of course, I wasn't making any money and I've been financially independent since I stepped out of college. So it was uh, bothering me. So I just went back to my project management and decided food blogging was not for me. Uh, then I think around 2013, uh, late 2013, early 2014, I came across Pinch of Yam and their income reports. And I was like, wow, amazing how people can, you know, uh, pursue their passion and uh, make money. I decided, OK, let me just, you know, start again. I started posting a few recipes a month, fortunately got accepted by blogger that helped. But then things got like really busy at work and I just had to drop food blogging altogether. Around 2015, my work was like really busy. I had no time for anything. And at that time, I was kind of contemplating quitting my job. But the trigger actually was the fact that my three-year-old child was having a difficult time in her daycare. So I decided I'll stay at home with her. And uh, and at that same time, I thought, why not dabble in blogging? But uh, And then the plan was like, I'll go back to work when she's ready to go to kindergarten full time. Is she in kindergarten now? She's in first grade now. <laughs> she's in first grade. I actually started blogging full time last year. I was posting recipes. I was not consistent, but I was learning a lot. Uh, I was reading a lot, but uh, what I was not doing was consistently posting. So last year I started to like focus full time on my blogging, but still I've made a lot of mistakes. I did buy a lot of courses. I went through the all those courses, but I never applied. It was just like, oh, I have to learn this now, I have to learn that now. I actually uh, started blogging seriously, like consistently after I found an accountability buddy. So I was telling hey, my traffic is not growing and I don't know why. I think my photos are decent. I don't know what's going on. She's like, so how many posts are you doing per month? I was like, oh, let me check. I don't know. <laughs> so that helped you know that pushed me in that direction of thinking that I have to be consistent I have to show up um, and like for those who have been blogging for years and they see no growth in their traffic and you need to stop and you need to figure out what's not working you know seek help like find a blogger friend or find a mentor and uh, like in my case if organic traffic is the cause then find an SEO expert uh, for me, you know, in my case I reached out to Casey Markey and that helped a lot uh, along so he will help you with the audit he'll you know tell you what's wrong with your site what you know how to do the right things but you have to do those things so I did my audit in 2018 but I started working on those items only in 2019 nothing's going to happen magically you have to put in that work to you know see results so I've been seeing uh, pretty decent results starting July of this year since since the time I started uh, posting uh, regularly and consistently I think you hit on a couple really great points. So first of all, I wanted to touch on the fact that an income seeing an income report from a really successful blogger was was the catalyst for you, like almost inspiration, like, whoa, if they can do it, then I can do that. And I think I've heard that from a handful of people that seeing an income report that is really profitable and positive is really inspiring and encouraging. So that's just I think that's really interesting. And then you have had like this kind of in and out journey with blogging, it sounds like, because you've been in it kind of part time and then out of it. And then, you know, partially engaged, thinking that maybe you'd go back to work full time. And then you just decided, you made the decision to dig in and just make it happen. And I love that. And then you were able to take a step back and look at the pieces that you needed to work on. You made that happen. So you, you saw that SEO was maybe a struggle that you could up your SEO game. So you got an audit. I think that's really smart. And I think that's going to be different for everybody. So maybe one person just kills it with SEO right out the gate. 
but they aren't taking very good photos or whatever their downfall might be. So I think that's really important to point out. And accountability. Getting an accountability partner is so vital in food blogging because not only are there so many different pieces that we all always have to be aware of, but it can be really lonely. And I think having someone else who's in the game can help pull us out of that. So I love that you found a partner right away. And if you don't do that, even just like go join the Facebook groups, find other people who are in it. As a general rule, food bloggers are pretty honest and nice. So if you ask people, like if you don't know what's wrong with your site, I think if you ask, hey, would you mind taking a peek at my site? Like, what are my downfalls? What do I need to work on? I think that most of them will be pretty honest with you. I totally agree. And uh, I was at Everything Food Conference, I think, uh, in 2018 when Nagi was there. And I had an opportunity for her to look at my food blog. And uh, the tips that she gave me was, like, phenomenal. She said that do not, like, just post randomly. There needs to be a theme to what you're posting. Like, So if you say you create a category on instant pot dinners, make sure there are, like, at least 8 to 10 posts that go inside that particular category. So that way you have a category, like whenever you're pulling up your recipe index, you have like 10 posts that come up, right? And then move on to the next category. Or or you could do like, you know, if you're doing three posts a week and you focus on three categories and say it's um, a drink or smoothie or something, a lunch and a dessert. So you are filling each category bucket evenly. Yeah? So that was one thing that stuck with me and that has helped me a lot. So now I know whatever I'm doing falls within a theme. It's not some random recipe like, you know, for instance, I'm posting about Indian food. I do not post about a Parthai recipe, which I have done in the past. I would not do it now. I would not post a Parthai recipe unless I have a plan of posting recipes, say, uh, green curry chicken that goes with it, like in the next five weeks. It's not, nothing is random on my blog anymore. That kind of goes along with finding your niche and really knowing what you're drilling down to underneath the umbrella of food blogging and what are people liking you for, what sings to you, what speaks to your soul, and really what causes you to create food sticking with that theme. And I love that you got that advice and that it just has kind of kept you going and kept you fueled on the right path because a lot of us get lost and we think that We need to create everything, including our grandmother's random casserole that may not (laughs) apply to your blog in any way. Thinking along those terms of like what what people are wanting for me, what is my passion, and then how can I serve that purpose? So I think that is a really big mistake that people make early on, especially because we want to get everything out there. But that isn't necessarily what we should be focusing on. So what other pieces of advice did you get? That was one. And posting regularly and also focusing on SEO, right? When you're uh, writing uh, posts, look for something that people are actually searching for. And I know people have covered this before. So I'm not going to delve deeper into it unless you want me to. But it's about, yeah, it's about like, you know, not posting random things, but posting about things that are people are looking for and for like for instance uh, during christmas uh, you know what you have to post do not post something that is a summer recipe uh, planning your content calendar in a way that is seasonal too be intentional about what you post keep keeping seasons and your audience in mind that's great advice so how did you know i'm curious how you guess seo was maybe a struggle of yours and Did somebody tell you that or did you just hear the term and know that you needed to dig in because you hadn't before? Or how did you know that? So there were two two factors that, uh, first of all, my organic traffic was not growing. And the other thing was I was hearing a lot about Casey on uh, food bloggers uh, uh, community, such as the Food Blogger Central uh, Facebook group uh, and also the Food Blogger Pro community. So I was hearing a lot about Casey and I started to follow him. And then I realized, oh, my God, I'm doing so many things. So uh, so as soon as possible, I think uh, it was early 2018 when I you know, asked him to do an audit and I finally got my turn in April. But he gave me like a list of things that I could do from January to April until my audit. And Casey is very generous with this information. He shares it in a lot of different channels, uh, Facebook groups and SEM Rush webinars. So I think if if somebody cannot afford an audit with him, just follow him. It, he shares a lot of information. And if you just apply them, you'll see a lot of difference. And there are so many avenues these days. I mean, I know he was kind of one of the pioneers for SEO and food blogging. But 
more and more are popping up every year. And they're really, really good at what they do. And that is literally all they do. So I think it's a really smart recommendation to just like exhaust the resources you have that are free. And a lot of these people, like you mentioned, Anna Shri, are extremely generous in what information they're sharing. And they they don't necessarily want to get paid. I mean, you can do an audit and you can get very detailed information. If you're afraid to invest, start with the free stuff because there's a ton of it out there. Listen to podcasts, go into all the Facebook groups you can. They even have Facebook groups themselves that you can go into. They do webinars. I mean, there, there's so much that you can absorb free. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you don't have to invest a lot when you're starting off. There is a lot of uh, free information available. I would also like to add that we also, like we live in a time where there's so much information. We also need to Make sure that we are not do it following like everybody. Like what I like to do is I pick one or two people that I trust whose teaching style resonates with me. And then I stick to that person. Like similarly, I follow three, four po- podcasts. I'll follow three, four uh, people in, in each areas like photography, SEO. And I would not like try to seek more resources at, from that point onwards because I can I can get very easily overwhelmed then I don't know who to follow who not to and there can be conflicting information uh, going on so just stick to a couple from each sections of food blogging if I can call it that way apply them most importantly I think that is excellent advice as well because there's so much information out there you can so easily get to that point of just being overloaded with information and like you said you don't know who to trust anymore (laughs) it's almost like you become overly saturated so finding those select few people that you really truly trust and then sticking with them I have people all the time who are like "Um, you should listen to this podcast about business or entrepreneurship or whatever and I'm like no I already have mine I've got mine set so I know exactly what you're talking about so how do you recommend that people find those trusted sources maybe if they're just starting out and they're like well I don't know who to trust or I don't know where to go what do you recommend there I think going to food blogging conferences are a great place to start you not only network with other food bloggers you know what's worked for them what's not worked for them and also during these conferences you have the experts coming in and if you if what they're saying resonates with you and if if they can show results for instance if there is an instagram blogger uh, i mean an instagram expert who is speaking on stage i would you know research about that person i would see how many followers that person has what kind of engagement that person has and if they uh, have a course to offer then i feel like if they, what they're saying on stage resonates with me then i go ahead and buy their course and uh, a uh, fact about me, I'm a course junkie. I buy a lot of courses. Like people binge watch Netflix shows. I do that with courses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I am like information junkie. Anything I can get my hands on that's going to help me improve my business or my life. I am like that with like self-development books, business books. I am like pretty saturated, but it's good. I mean, it's good information. And I actually, it's funny because I wrote down a sentence here that I was going to say, and you said the exact sentence, but you just said like, if you're at a conference or if you're listening to somebody speak and they resonate with you, then you can kind of feel that and get a vibe about whether or not there's someone you can trust and follow. But I do think that you really need that feeling like you, it's, and it's not something you can even explain in words. It's just like, when you are listening and you just are like, yes, that person said it exactly how I needed to hear it. That's when you know that they're a trusted source. Totally. They like, you know, they speak to you. It feels like, yes, that's, that's my person. Yeah, exactly. Like they're speaking directly to you. You just know it just clicks. So I think it's just a matter of hearing a variety of people out and sorting through the noise and getting to those people that really speak to you. We kind of glossed over this a little. I wanted to back up just a bit and ask your opinion on what if a newer blogger is, I don't know, say a year in and they're just not getting traction and they're wondering, like you were at one point, like, what am I doing wrong? How do you recommend that people identify what their problem is outside of maybe asking for an accountability partner? partner's opinion 
Uh, so the one one way I would do is find out where you're lacking. For instance, if you see that your organic search is not bringing you in results, then work with an SEO expert. It's also good uh, good to know who where your audience is. Like if your traffic is not coming, for instance, my uh, my niche is Indian food recipes, and they don't do well in Pinterest. And I've talk to other Indian food bloggers and, you know, ask them, is Pinterest working for you? And they were like, no, it's not working for you, for them as well. So that that way I know that it's pointless for me to spend like $300, $400 on a Pinterest VA. I have taken a, uh, taken a pinning perfect course. Uh, and I, I it's not that I'm not active on Pinterest, but I know that's not going to be my number one traffic channel you have to like dissect areas and see for instance if social media is not working for you why is it not working for you and like Carly mentioned in her interview with you find those niche groups for the same thing work for me as well like for instance I post a lot about instant pot I found those niche Facebook groups and I've started posting it and my traffic has exponentially increased because of that also like uh, try to get feedback from people if you can like if your food photography is not hitting the mark what can you do to improve it it doesn't have to be like world-class food photography it needs to be clear it needs to be it needs to be uh, not messy and uh, it should be pleasing to the eyes that's it you don't have to make it like super awesome that's what I've realized that was one of my mistakes I don't know how many food blogging courses I have taken because I thought oh god my pictures are not that great you don't need a ton of food photography courses you take a couple and apply them like you know you probably hear me say apply apply probably a lot more than most people say because that has been my problem Uh, I'm like okay this course is not working for me because I'm not getting the results but I you you probably have to go through each course I think a couple of times to get the most out of it that's what I've realized it yes that's a huge one that people overlook they're like well I took this course and I applied what they told me but they are leaving out the fact that they need time to practice 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 like every day if you need to until you get better because if you do practice every day you are going to get better and I liked what you said about you can take as many courses as you want but if you don't actually apply it then (laughs) what's the point right because most likely if you take a good course, they're going to give you some action steps to take and you actually need to do those things in order to make gains, I think. Okay, so what else? I wanted to mention that I just love that you realized that your Pinterest game was lacking and you went back and you researched it. You researched it. You investigated like why? And not only that, but you went to other bloggers who post about Indian food And, you know, you dug deep and like, okay, it's not working for them either. So I think that's really smart because I think a lot of us just think along those lines of, well, if one food blogger is killing it on Pinterest, then I should be able to too. But we need to look at the different parts, the different pieces and really investigate. So what a smart thing for you to do. And why, why isn't Indian food doing well on Pinterest. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, no, we actually have brainstormed like, you know, why why are people not looking for Indian food on Pinterest? It's just like the audience seems to not there. But there are like there are a lot of Indian food uh, groups on Facebook and that seems to be working. And I've realized that uh, like I focus only on a few channels at a time. For instance, I am not uh, very focused on Instagram this year, but my focus is to move on to Instagram just to diversify my income. But I, I, knowing that I will not get a lot of traffic from Instagram, what has helped me this year was to not multitask, just focus on one thing at a time, one thing to do every day, one thing to one project to do every month. Because otherwise, I like I said, I I can get easily overwhelmed with like two million things on the two uh, to do list to do. No, so for this, for instance, this month was about creating a welcome series. So I listened to Sarah Nelson's interview with you, and that was extremely helpful. So I focused on welcome series this month. Last month was about restructuring my blog. So that I do all those projects, and I love doing those projects because I love being all technical on my blog. But I finish my set of posts for the month, and that's when I do that. That's my goal. Priority, prioritize your food blogging posts first. You said this maybe in our pre-interview chat, but you said the words multitasking is overrated, I think. And I totally 100% agree with that because 
a lot of people think that it's like a, a bragging point, right? Like I am the greatest multitasker ever, but it, there's actually not much value in multitasking because you're using so much energy. You're depleting yourself. So you're really doing yourself a disservice and your business if you're trying to do it all in any given day. So I love that you just really hone in on one thing and focus on it until it's done. Now, do you do that day to day, project to project, aside from just regular blog content that you need to create? Or how do you do that? For instance, you gave the example of creating an email series. Did you do that just like you hunkered down and you did that for like a week straight until it was done? Or do you just add it into your calendar and chunks so that you know to expect it Uh, no I'm not good at doing it in chunks so that's why I have what I did was I try to finish up all my posts of like for instance if there if I had to write 12 posts this month I finished them like by the third week of the month and then I did because what I've realized that I lose my focus if I uh, do it like in chunks and when I get back to it I've forgotten what I've done even though I've started writing notes on where I left off it's never easy to pick it up so I, I always treat it as one project, finish it off, and then move on to the next. Um, so that's why I finish all my blog posts first. And then I did my welcome series for one whole week and did nothing else. And I always say this, you've probably heard me say it before, but I love that flow, that magic flow that you can get into when you're really focused on a single project. And then when you leave it to do something else, you lose some of that magic. So getting back into the flow can be really hard. So I love your strategy. I think there's immense value in that and it kind of goes along with the batching theme like doing one thing one day doing your filming on one day and doing your photos photo editing on another day I just so strongly believe that there's power in doing that and really taking the value out of the word multitasking because I too think that it's just such an overrated word I couldn't agree more. And that these are this stopping to multitask was one of the things that helped me, you know, focus on my game. It was one of the game changers for this year. I would totally say that. Wow. That's I mean, that's a big, bold statement. So that's huge, though. And it just shows you what power lies behind that simple act of just taking multitasking out of your life. And I know it's hard, right? Because so many of us do it. We have so many duties to do every single day that we're, I feel like we're all masters of multitasking. So it's like a groove that we get into. And so taking that out is a really hard thing to do. So do you have advice for like making that change? Because that can be really abrupt. And it happens to me all the time. For instance, if there is a really good course that is on sale, and especially during the Thanksgiving, it was so I was like, oh my God, I need to buy this and dig in right now. I was like, no, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> you have to finish these four blog posts first and then only you can do that. I have to like, I talk to myself a lot. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you're being a mother to yourself. <laughs> being the CEO and the employee at the same time like, so you can't do it and it's like I, I believe like for me like I said I love courses and it's a treat so I have to do all the stuff that I may or may not want to do first and then go to the good stuff that I really like mm, that's a great way to look at it too just treating those things that kind of try to distract you and creep in seeing them as rewards so that wait I have to get this done and i for the record, I speak to myself a lot too. And I have had to tell myself no, because I am constantly thinking of new projects I want to do. And I mean, it's ridiculous. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I'm like, okay, I've been up for an hour thinking about a random new project. Go back to sleep. Mm-hmm. What are you doing awake? So I literally have to say that to myself, like, Megan, stop. And then my boys get used to it. Now they're like, are you talking to yourself about were or like they just start asking me like can I talk to you right now you're talking to work Megan but it is like you have to be firm with yourself and just set boundaries for yourself because you are the boss but you're also doing all the work I feel you on that Anna Shree I am with you on the self-talk and also like being firm with myself once in a while because goodness gracious it can get out of control right yeah, totally. <laughs> like, and I, cre- I create a checklist and I post it like right front of my laptop and every time I do a post I check mark and then at the bottom of the to-do list I have like the to-do post list I have this oh you can do this course now yeah it's my ladder to get there 
Oh, I love that. I just came up with a kind of a process too within the past few months. I am loving it. It's very similar to that, but it's just in Google Calendar. So I have everything sorted out in my day. And then as I go, I turn it red. Red means it's done. And then at the end of the day, I have a like a self-care or like a something along the lines of what you're talking about, like some little reward that I can give myself. And some days I look at my to-do list in the morning and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get all this done. But then if I think like an afternoon coffee for me is just so indulgent and amazing for some reason. So on those days, I just think of pulling into Starbucks and (laughs) getting that amazing latte. And sometimes that's all it takes. Like a $5 latte can force me to get a ton of work done. So I love that you use rewards too. Yeah. A latte can be totally motivating. I can, I can totally relate to that. Yeah. The little things, I mean, just find those little things in your life that really speak to you. They're like little joys that give you immense comfort, but you can use them as tools to kind of like manipulate yourself. <laughs> like I know it almost feels like you're talk- you're dealing with some other person and you're manipulating that person or, you know, hey, you know, there is going to be a reward. Do this. It's like I'm talking to my inner child or something. I know. We have got like multiple personality food blogging syndrome or something going on. Oh, so that. OK, let's move on a little bit. So what are some other things that you identify as blogging mistakes that you want to mention for other people? In real life and in blogging life, I do not compare my journey with others. Sometimes it does creep up, I'll be honest, but I try not to because we all have different circumstances in our life. I think the point is to do the best with what we have. Uh, I could always say, oh, if I had focused on my blog in 2010 and I would have been like at 5 million page views by now or, you know, whatever that comparison I could be making but I stop and like you know I had certain circumstances I had like I had you know I would put my kid first at that time I actually quit my job in 2016 and if I look back I had time from 2016 until now and it's almost like four years uh, but I'm like oh I have not progressed so much I could you know get all those negative thoughts in my head but I don't I'm, I'm I have learned to be satisfied with what I have and if I want more then I have to work harder and I built a path to get there and uh, there are a lot of things that are not in our hands right like the SEO thing you can do your best but there, there's an element of luck too but what what's there in our hands it's like consistent consistent posting producing good quality content giving our readers what they want and not just throwing out a post for the sake of it is it going to be helpful i have been so so careful about what i post these days that and i'm i'm seeing the response i'm seeing the results so anybody who's saying who's thinking that okay things are not working my way just reevaluate your you know, situation. And of course, like, like I said, do not compare, like, like with the recent, recent uh, Google update, right, a lot of people got hit, and it's so easy to get disheartened, and see years of your work being like totally lost, because, but I think it's like a very uh, cyclical thing, right, it goes up and down, you continue doing what you do best. And also, like, find, for instance, if um, you lost traffic and uh, who will find another uh, other avenues, uh, maybe, you know, Facebook groups will work for you. So diversify as well. But uh, again, do not do not compare your journey with others. Like if somebody did not lose their Google uh, traffic, don't think about it. Like, why did they not lose it? Why did I lose it? If there's anything that you can do introspect and see what, what you could have done better. And of course, like I said, <laughs> there's sometimes things beyond our hand, but what, what's in our hand, we should, we should be able to control that. I, I love how you touched on that because you mentioned like not comparing yourself to others, obviously. I think that's a huge one, but you also mentioned not comparing yourself to what your like your past is and how you looked back and you're like well I could have been really mad at myself for not being you know larger having better numbers or whatever but instead you just took it took it as an opportunity to learn and see what you can do now and I think you are so right in saying that focusing on what is in our control right in front of us is what we should be doing 
we can take all of the information from the experts and do everything and things still can't go our way. I mean, I think that's proving true right now with all of the crazy Google updates and people are just beside themselves because they're like, I'm doing it all right and I'm still not winning in this avenue. So just, you know what, if it's in your control, great, do what you can. If not, then kind of got to just let it go. And I know that's so hard, especially for people who work so dang hard (laughs) to grow. But it was heartbreaking to see so many of my favorite food bloggers being hit by the update. And I felt bad. It's like years and years of work that has been dead gone there to you know get them to the, those many page views but i think like it like i said it's going to come back we just need to like maybe take a week you know uh, to get out of, get it out of the system like okay i'm sad let me do something to cheer myself and then like start all over again because if this is what you truly love then you know just keep at it your your audience will find you and that's what I like to believe. I agree with you. And I think that this last update, or I shouldn't even say the last because I feel like there's one every week, but one of the most recent ones that was a really devastating blow for a lot of food bloggers, I feel like a lot of us went through those stages of grief because what you just said is so true. We work so hard for years. We put our hearts and souls in thinking that everything we're doing is building up to something better. And then when we get hit really hard, it's a huge blow to our business and also to our ego because, oh my gosh, like the amount of love and heart and work that we put into this is insane. So it is like we've grieved and then I I love what you said that we've just got to pick ourselves back up and see this as an opportunity to learn and grow and maybe diversify even and get back in there. Don't let this tear you down because Unfortunately, this up and down tumultuous thing <laughs> is part of a food blogger's life. I mean, it's and that's never going to change, yeah. right? I mean, it's part of the game. And when you get in it, you learn that pretty fast. It kind of weeds out the people that can't tolerate it, can't take yeah. it. Food blogging is not for everyone, right? Which I have realized no. over the years. It's like you need a lot of grit. It's like raising a baby. <laughs> Like so <laughs> seriously things, yeah, it's like so many things I would have never expected it to be this hard to be honest like I've done a lot of hard things in my life but this is probably the hardest it is and people think it's like a really easy way to earn cash and that you don't work very hard but I can honestly say that I have never worked this hard by far I mean by a landslide it's the hardest job I've ever had but also the most rewarding. So talk to us about some other problems or blogging mistakes. Okay, so we we talk a lot about knowing our avatar, our reader, but uh, I take it uh, uh, in a different direction. I think know yourself. You are not only your best employee, but you're also the CEO of your company. You To get to be really successful, you need to know how to get the most out of yourself. For instance, like everybody has a different strategy. Your strategy will be based, should be based on who you are. Like, are you a morning person? Like, for instance, you go to all these food blogging conferences where somebody says, oh, I wake up at three and I do this and that. And then you're like, okay, let me make that part of my strategy. <laughs> but that won't work for you it's like you you could be somebody who likes to stay up at night there's a different time you're the most productive and I think it's uh, before like I, I wish I had done this before before you know, even uh, I started like saying hey I'll follow this strategy or that strategy I think I should have done which I've already done now it's like found, I found out what's the best time I am productive whether you know I like to wake up in the morning write it down I wrote it down literally everything like what do I like about blogging what do I not like about blogging? So what the part that I don't like about blogging, can I outsource it now? Or maybe, you know, if I don't have the budget right now, maybe it's like, you know, a to-do for the future. So right, I also wrote down how much time I have every day for blogging. I wrote down what stresses me out. I wrote down what gives me anxiety. Like going through this whole exercise of just like, you know, knowing what I like, what I don't like, knowing more about myself. And you, we all know ourselves, but, you know, just writing it down, putting it on paper helps us get a lot of clarity on what we can or cannot accomplish in a week, in a month, in a day, uh, in a whole year. So I use that information to create a daily, weekly, monthly, and a yearly plan and use that to set up achievable targets. 
like especially when you have kids at home who are little they can fall sick so taking all these into consideration i developed my strategy for in, for instance i could like you know someone told me they post like five times a week but that can't be my strategy i just don't have the time for posting five times a week i started with three posts a week this year but i realized that was causing me a lot of stress so i came down to two a week and that keeps me sane so that's why i think it's very important to know your limitations your strengths before you plan your strategy for the year. I could not possibly say it any better than you did before, but you said something about clear uh, writing things down, giving you clarity about who you are. And there's such a deep inner truth to that. Um, I am a huge journaler. I write in my journal every day because I just feel like you can get to know yourself so much better when you do that and things pop up all the time that I'm even surprised by. I'm like, I had no idea that that was a strength or an issue or a a pain point or whatever. So writing is a really good first step for someone wanting to dig into getting to know who they are as a blogger. Don't you think? Yeah, totally. And you know, the funny thing is like a lot of courses start with this. Like if you take, um, like for instance, I took a course a few years back and it was like, identify your strengths. I was like, well, I'm not doing that. Like I'm going to skip through that doesn't help. It's like too much work, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm thinking, Oh, there's a point of, there was a point for that particular worksheet to be in there. It is really helpful to, you know, help you determine your plan. Like, how do you plan for the entire year without knowing how much time do you actually have for blogging each week? How do you like, you know, outsource things when you don't know what you like or you don't like? Like putting it down on paper makes everything so clear. And doing that or over the course of maybe a week or two and just writing everything down and then reviewing it. Some things I forget. I just went through an old journal the other day from like a year ago and I had completely forgotten about this project idea. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So just reviewing the stuff that you write to regularly or maybe even writing stuff in sight and keeping it in sight so that you can be reminded, this is what I'm good at. This is what I hated today. This is something I need to incorporate into my life more. I think that is um, valuable, not just for food bloggers starting out, but for all of us. I think that is a just a little golden nugget that we can all take away from this. Yeah, And as I grow older, I have this mom brain that I don't remember anything. So writing it down helps. It also helps me develop an attitude of gratitude where I see, okay, you know, so many good things are happening in my life. Like if my my traffic crashed, fine. There are other things that I can look up to. So I love the whole idea of writing it down. Yeah, I love that too. There's power in that for sure. Is there anything else that you feel like we haven't covered as far as common food blogging mistakes to avoid? Uh, no, I think I'm good, uh, Megan. I think I I poured my heart out. <laughs> like it's like I all like whenever we go to food blogging conferences, it's so so great to just sit around and you know talk about what's working for you and what's not working for uh, you. And I think this year I had a lot to share because I think I grew as a blogger too, and I learned so many things. I applied all the things that I learned, so I feel mighty proud of myself for the. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, because I I was like, you know, I I was like giving like, oh, God, you left a good job and you're doing this and you're not even making money. So I had to get out of that that negative self-talk. So once I got out of it, I'm I'm seeing great progress, you know, saying say good things and uh, just focus on the good things in life. That is amazing. I'm happy for you. And you're not alone. We all go through those stages where we do that negative self-talk and we start believing it. But that is one thing that I really love food blogging conferences for. So we can see that we're not alone and we can connect and connecting with other people who deal with this crazy job day in and day out is hugely important in my opinion. I agree. Yes. If you, if you feel that, you know, you are alone, I think going to a food blogging conference is very important. Just get out and meet somebody. It's been life changing for a lot of people. You find people to talk to, like most family members don't understand when you talk about talking. So it's a great way to make friends. It is. And I know it's scary. I've been in that place of fear where I think I'm inadequate compared to other people. And it's really hard to put yourself in a situation where you think you're in your mind, you think you're going to be like lesser than people, but 
I promise if you're listening, it is not like that. And it's so, so worth it. Oh, well, we have talked about a lot today. What a great chat. I just loved everything that we talked about today. And I think a lot of these mistakes are common, but not things that we often talk about. You know, they're like kind of brushed under the rug or maybe just not identified. So I appreciate your insight, Anna Shree, and thank you for taking the time today. Thanks for having me, Megan. I really appreciate it. And, and I'm happy to share all my all my failings with people so that they can learn from what the, from the mistakes I've made. Oh, well, I appreciate that. And I know that everybody else listening does as well. So before you go, do you have a favorite quote or words of inspiration beyond everything you've shared today for our fellow food bloggers? Yeah, I have one. And yeah, it's a good one. I, I think it's a good one. It, it goes, uh, knowing is not enough. We must apply. Wishing is not enough. We must do. Oh, amen. I love that. I think I'm going to write that one down. That's a good one. I am such a quote inspiring like word girl. They keep me going sometimes on days when I'm just struggling a little bit. I just like read through random quotes and I feel somehow so much better. Yeah, me too. It's, it's definitely uplifting. I do that too. So it's funny, like we talk to ourselves and we read quotes. <laughs> so we have quite a few things. Well, talk. next time I'm talking to myself and reading myself a quote again, I will think of you, Anna Shri, and think that I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Oh, good. Well, I am so grateful for your time today. Anna Shri has a list of favorite resources relating to everything we've talked about today. These can be found on her show notes page at eatblogtalk.com forward slash simmer to slimmer. Anna Shri, tell my listeners the best place to find you online. I am everywhere at slimmer, simmer to slimmer dot com at face on Facebook, Instagram. I'm not active on Twitter, but uh, <laughs> for the and, and, and at Pinterest too. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being here. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you next time. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.